Good morning. My name is Josh. I'm one of the other elders here. And we are to the end of our series, The Summer on the Mount. We went through the last, it's been three months of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So this is the last week. I'm going to go, have you go to Matthew 7, as we're going to be in a minute. 13 through 29 is what we're going to read. But first I want to say, what is it we've been doing here by doing the Sermon on the Mount? We've been talking about what the kingdom of God should look like. Right? What does the kingdom look like? We've talked about what the king himself, Jesus, says his kingdom looks like. How should we behave? How should we interact? How do we talk and interact with one another? And I was reminded of someone else in the Bible that gave a similar message. The kids are actually talking about him this week. The kids that were up here and some of the other children, they're talking about Moses, God's faithfulness in his life. They're talking about him when he was a little baby being rescued. But when Moses, when he got to the end of his life, he preached this long sermon. We call it the book of Deuteronomy. But he essentially just got up and retold the law. And at the end, at the end, when he gets to the end of Deuteronomy, what he says is, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. He's given him, here's what God's asked of you. Here's what God wants out of you. And he says, there's two choices. One leads to life, one leads to death. Jesus, a better Moses, has come along. The whole book of Matthew is pointing to Jesus. He's better than Matthew. He's better than David. He's better than all these Old Testament saints. And Jesus gets up and says the same thing. He he sets two options before the people. He spent this whole time describing what the kingdom should look like, and when he gets to the end, he kind of says there's two ways. There's the world's way, and then there's Jesus' way. So if this sounds pretty clear and direct, what I say today, hopefully hopefully that is, that's good. That's what Jesus does. Jesus ends this message with a very clear Here's two choices. The one is the world's way, which is make up your own laws, follow somebody else's, it doesn't really matter, do what you want, but you're going to end up somewhere evil, somewhere destructive. Moses says death. Jesus would have said hell. Like this ends up somewhere ugly. And some of those paths aren't going to look ugly at the beginning. Everyone promises something good at the end. They'll promise heaven. They don't, they don't, they don't sell you on you're going to hell. They sell you on heaven. It'll be great but it's going to end in death. And there's Jesus' way. Jesus' way, he says, it's his rules, his kingdom, but you're going to know the living God. It's not going to be on your own. You're going to know God himself. So when he talks about these two ways, he makes it very clear there's two options. And I'm going to talk about what it looks like a lot, because that's what he does in the Sermon on the Mount, but I don't want you to miss, it is not just what I do that sets me on one of these two paths. It's knowing Jesus himself. Jesus, we sang a song about firm foundation. We're going to talk about that parable in a minute. The foundation is either on Jesus or it's not. My righteousness does not come from myself. It comes from Jesus. And then anything I do is in response to that. So I want to make that very clear. What I want to do is read Matthew 7. Maybe. Read Matthew 7, 13 through 29. I want want you to hear, there's at least four different analogies he gives that all say kind of the same thing in a different way. So I'm going to put it up here on the screen, and we'll read through this. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. Those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. Healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them 
and be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Let me pray, and then we'll continue. Dear God, I thank you that you, you've declared very clearly the two ways that are in life. And one of them leads to you and everything good, and one of them leads away from you and to nothing good. I just pray that we would clearly see the difference and see that it, it is not about us. It's about you and you knowing us and us knowing you. I just pray this would be clear and I would not get in the way of how you ended your own sermon. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's these two ways, right? Everything's going to have two on it, in case that's not clear. If you see the sermon notes, there's two of everything. There's two ways, there's two paths. When he talks about these two paths, they are very, very distinct. One's narrow, it's hard. Very few people find it, but it leads to life. It gives this good one, right? The other path, he says, it's, it's broad, it's easy. There's a whole bunch of people on it, but it leads nowhere good. It leads to destruction. This analogy, I think, helps us understand everything else he says for the next several verses. For the whole rest of the chapter, he has this one clear analogy. There's, there's two paths in life. Which one are you going to be on? So every analogy should come back to that question. Which path am I on? Which, which side represents me? Which right, side represents my life, my relationship with God? So look, I want you to look at the, word, the words for life, the good path. What are the ways it's described? He says a lot of difficult things. One thing I find fascinating is he doesn't, he doesn't stand there and plead with them. He doesn't beg. He doesn't sing the chorus six more times. He just says, here's the path. Choose it. It's a, it's a command. It's a declaration. He doesn't teach like their scribes. with, Well, you could do this or this might happen. He just says, this is the path. Take it. He says it's difficult. One of the words in there says it's agonizing. It's original language. When he says it's hard, this is not just a, hey, I might, might have a problem or two. It's literally the word where they, they use to say they crush grapes and turn them into wine. It's the word we get for persecution. Like, it's difficult. It's constricting. It presses down upon you. This is not to scare you, but to say, if your life looks like this, understand Jesus said it was going to look like that. He also says that you're, you're, you're going on your own, right? Jesus is there, but you're not on this path just because of your family, just because your parents took you to church, just because you have some friends that are Christians, just because you're here this morning does not mean you're on this narrow path. When Jesus talks about this path other places, when he preaches the gospel, he says, repent. He calls men to repentance, to change what path they were on, this path of destruction, and go his way instead. It's hard, it's difficult, but it ends in life. This is the positive part, right? All the other words sound negative. It's narrow, it's hard, there's very few people with you, and yet it ends in life. The other path, quite honestly, sounds easier, right? It's broad, it's easy, it's do whatever I want. My own laws, my own goodness, my own description, I can pick somebody else's. It doesn't really matter. Truth doesn't matter, my actions don't matter. As long as I'm consistent in myself, I can do whatever I want. This, this is the way we naturally go. It'd be easy for me to sit here and judge the world for teaching this, but this is where my heart wants to go as well, right? This is our natural inclina inclination to go the way of the world. Lots of people are on that path. Jesus literally says this, right? There's a bunch of people there. So if your decision-making process is, hey, lots of people are doing this, this must be the right way. Jesus literally says the opposite. There's going to be a whole bunch of people going this way. Don't make decisions based on what the majority is doing. And it ends in death. It sounds like a dark, harsh way to start, but it's essentially what Jesus says. What I would like to do is tell a story that I, I find explains this better than I can. I don't know if you've ever read Pilgrim's Progress. There's a Christian book that's written in like the 1600s. It's an old book, but I would encourage you to read it. I would encourage you to find it. They have modern translations that make it a little easier to read. The translation that I've read, it has Bible verses throughout it. There's footnotes and explains what he's trying to get at. But it's this allegory written about a Christian man living his life. 
when I was younger and I had different ideas, I thought of a great book to read. I'm like, I want to write an allegory of what the Christian life should look like. And then I read Pilgrim's Progress and I thought, never mind. It's already been done. It's already been done better than I could have ever done it. There's a reason people are still reading it hundreds of years later. But what he does is he talks about something, the same analogy of entering the path. And I want to describe his story of what it looks like. He, cops, he, says, he uses the word wicked a lot, and I'm going to explain the word wicked. Not wicked, wicked, with a T. So, honest answer why this is up here. I googled the word wicked and didn't put the word gate at the end, the way it phrase he uses. This is what I got. This is not the wicked I'm talking about. This is not just for me. It's from Star Wars. Um, this is half because of me, and this is half because of Andrew. Andrew has a line in the contract at the church that if we don't talk about Star Wars once in a while, he leaves, so... He claimed he was sick this morning. I think he was just waiting to see that I would actually show this. His name is Wicket. It's not the right Wicket. Um, it does come from the English word that means small. He's, he's a small creature, just like this. This is the Wicket. Have you ever seen cricket played? This is what the batsman's trying to hit the ball away from. The bowler's throwing the ball out. There's literally a person behind it. His position is the Wicket keeper. It's a small piece of sticks. It's a small gate. This is still not the wicket that I'm going to talk about from the book. They come from this. You see this large entrance in the wall. There's a huge main gate. There's windows. Do you see the little narrow door beside it? There's a tiny door for one person. That's a wicket gate. That's a narrow gate. So there's the large door. The army can come through. Troops can move through. Large groups of people can come through. But at night, when they've sealed it up, and there's just a couple travelers are letting it through, they let them in through the wicket gate, through the narrow gate. So this is the analogy, this is the description that John Bunyan uses in Pilgrim's Progress. There's this man, he finds out his city's doomed to destruction. He finds out from the man named the Evangelist that he should flee the wrath to come. And this person, all he tells him, go along the wall, find the light, enter by the narrow gate. Enter by the wicket gate, is the way he says it. So Christian goes this way, he has... Lots of difficulty I'm going to skip over. I would encourage you to read. He has lots of difficulty. Some people help him. He eventually makes it to the gate. And when he enters the gate, he understands why he went that way. He learns who Jesus is. He's confronted with the cross. He's confronted with his own sin. He's confronted with the role of the Holy Spirit in his life. All these good images of what he's supposed to do in his life. But he's also given a scroll. He's given this piece of paper that represents a couple things. One is it kind of is the Bible to him. It shows him who he is and teaches him things, but then he takes it. It's kind of like a passport. He's told, take this. When you make it to the end of your journey, when you make it to the celestial city, this is the way to get in. You only get this by entering the narrow gate. So Christian has went this way, and then he leaves the gate. He comes out along the wall, and he sees some men that were laying there that don't seem to care which way they get in. A couple of them are lazy and sloth, and they don't even want to care which way they go. They just lay there. They represent... The world's responses to Jesus sometimes. It doesn't matter what Jesus said. Then he, he goes a little further. He finds some other men have hopped over the wall, and they're trying to take the path with him. And he tells them, I entered by the narrow gate. Why are you coming in this way? Their names are formality, hypocrisy, names like this. And they're like, it doesn't matter which way. It doesn't matter how you enter, as long as I end up the same destination. I think they represent a large, large section of people that go to church in our country. Not entering by the narrow gate, going whichever way, they, whichever way they wanted. And this is proven true when they come to this hill. There's this hill that's difficult to climb. The path is going straight up the hill. Christian goes up it. The other two are like, this is hard. I'm not going this way. So they go a different path. They go around the hill. He never sees them again. They've disappeared. They've lost the main path. They don't make it to the celestial city. He has many other encounters, other friends, people that are going with them. I'm telling you guys if every response is negative. He does have friends that come with him and go the same path. I would encourage you to read yourself to understand the other people in there. But when he makes it finally to the end, he makes it to the celestial city, there's another man that comes along whose name is Ignorance and says, I don't have a scroll. I didn't go your way, but I'm at the city. I'm going to go in. When he tries to go in, there's these creatures that come and take him. They essentially represent angels. They take this man named Ignorance and take him to hell because he didn't enter by the narrow gate. He didn't walk the hard way. He didn't have the scroll. But when Christian gets there, he's done everything the evangelist told him. 
the things that Jesus has told him along the way. He's entered by the narrow gate. He's taken the path. He has been helped tremendously along the way by God and by friends and by others. But when he gets there, he hands him the scroll, and he, is, he enters into the celestial city. There's a lot of other things going on in this book, but that, that little piece of it, that theme running through the middle, this path is hard, right? People tell you there's many paths. There's really only two. One leads to life. All the others lead to death. So there's two paths. There's also two teachers. Verse 15 only lists one of them. It describes this wolf in sheep's clothing, right? Jesus is essentially declaring, you're not all sheep. There's wolves along the path. There are people purposely trying to deceive you. Just like Christian, was tr they tried to deceive him at different steps. There are people trying to tell you, you don't have to go that way. It's hard, it's narrow, it's kind of narrow-minded, it seems difficult, pick the easy path. There are people telling you that. Paul uses this phrase later when he's talking to the Ephesian elders. He says, ravenous wolves are going to come in among you and try to tear you apart. So what does this mean? How, do I, how would I recognize this sort of false teacher? The next section we're going to talk about, the next verse is we talked about the fruit of this teacher, but I do want to say how their life is lived is important. But one of the other ways we recognize the false teacher is what they teach. What do they talk about? There are a lot of Christians today that do not have a, do not have a godly worldview. They do not have a biblical worldview. I saw one statistic recently where they had some survey, they've given questions, they have people answer, and it was a single-digit number of self-professing Christians that have a biblical worldview. So we're deceived by the wolves all the time because we don't even know what the Bible says. I want to read just a couple verses to kind of say it's important. The Bible tells us to pay attention to this. This is in Jude. He says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for the, for the condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God, or God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord. Jude is saying, contend for the faith. There are people that are going to pervert it, people that are going to make it focus on anything but Jesus, anything else but Jesus. <clears throat> so it's important for us to pay attention to these people. What, what is it they teach? One of the ones that is clearly pointed out in Ezekiel, he responds to some false prophets. It says, precisely because they have misled my people, saying, peace when there is no peace. There's a story in the Old Testament where these men are building a wall, and someone comes along, and the wall's not structurally sound, and they just kind of paint over the problem. And they say, don't worry about it. It's, it's good. And in the analogy, he's saying, they're declaring peace when it's not peace. So when I stand up here and say, there's life and death, they would say, just tell them a funny story and then move on. Don't scare them. Don't tell them hard things. Don't tell them there's life and death. Just tell them peace. It's fine. There's a lot of false teachers that do this. What else could they do? There's first in First John that talks about their view of Jesus being wrong. This is one of the key things. He says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have come, uh, gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So I'm going to keep going back to Jesus over and over again. He's this way to life. A correct view of Jesus is important. And I'm not going to try to tell you all the ways they corrupt a view of Jesus. What I want to tell you instead is be like the Bereans. In Acts 17, Paul the Apostle comes in then to teach them. And what do they do? They don't just accept Paul. They, they, says they study the scriptures daily to see if what he said was true. They're not just believing the person up front talking. Just because someone has a microphone doesn't mean they have any idea what they're talking about. Test it. See if it's true. Compare it to what the Bible says. Talk with other Christians about it. <clears throat> What I want to say clearly is it's easy to study the Bible and learn a lot of facts and a lot of information but not be confronted with God himself. So when I say study the Bible, I don't mean just learn names, learn phrases, learn 
stuff, I mean learn who God is. Understand this path to life, who Jesus is, that it's important you know him, not just some stuff he said. The next verse is to sort of describe what this false teacher's life would look like. It should also describe your life, right? It says there's two different kinds of plants. There's this analogy where he talks about grapes and figs versus thistles and thorns. Do you notice the plant by what it grows? I've seen this clearly in my own backyard this summer. I have what I thought was a good gift, some flowers in this pot on the patio for my wife that I put in there, and I will blame maybe the place I bought the flowers from, but quite honestly, they look awful. (laughs) They have been watered repeatedly. They did not do well in the summer heat. There were flowers. They probably weren't going to produce real fruit you could eat anyway, but they didn't produce enough to even look nice most of the year. The exact same yard, exact same patio, similar pots. There are cherry tomato plants. And if you know this time of year, there are tomatoes coming out like crazy. There's fruit popping out. I don't know if you like tomatoes, it's probably my favorite thing that grows in a plant. They're delicious, they're juicy, they're red. For some reason the birds aren't eating them before they get to them, like it looks like perfection. So these two same things planted in pots on the same patio the same summer, watered the same amount of times, one's producing nothing. One's dying on the vine, looks awful, we should probably throw them away. The other one, producing fruit. So you see this analogy of fruit. What does your life look like? Which kind of plant are you? Is it grapes and figs, cherry tomatoes? Or is it dying flowers? Is it thistles, thorn bushes? Is it things that should just be thrown into the fire? That's the analogy he talks about. And what I want to also say is that too often in the Christian life we hear this. You say you should produce fruit. And the first things I think that lots of people think of are people should come. We should have more attendance. We should have better giving. We should have some sort of numbers growth. Sure, those things are nice. I don't think that's the main thing he's talking about here. I think, oops, skip twice. Galatians, when Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, this is the kind of stuff he's talking about. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Like These are the fruit we should be producing. This is what our lives should look like. This is another way to say the same thing Jesus has said for two and a half chapters, right? What did he say? What should your life look like? What does the kingdom look like? It looks like the Beatitudes. Do you mourn? Do you thirst for righteousness? Are you salt and light in the world around you? Have you controlled your anger, your lust, your covenants, your passions, your marriage? Have you lived it in a godly way? Are you giving? Are you praying? Are you asking and seeking and knocking? All these descriptions, we've had this bumper video every week, those sort of phrases that flash across the screen. I don't know why it happened this way. None of the sermons I've given this summer have been phrases that are up there for some reason. But all those phrases are what he's talking about. Producing fruit looks like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Does your life produce fruit like that? Before you start to think this is a, hey, I should try harder and white-knuckle it, I want you to see what it looks like. In Psalm 1, when this is the same kind of imagery is described, how do you produce fruit? It says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And the leaf does not wither. All that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. The same analogy, same idea. The tree gets the nutrients. The tree planted by the water is the one growing the one that's thriving. You need to be connected to God. This is not a, hey, please make your checklist, please be a good person this week. This is be connected to God so the fruit is produced, that there are good things that come out of your life because you're connected to the source of life. It doesn't come out of you. And then there's two responses. There's two responses here. One is very clearly described in this passage, verses 21 and 23, where he says, Some people are going to reach the end of life and they're still deceived. They went down this death and destruction path and they thought they were on the path to life. It's a scary verse, right? I don't hear a lot of people doing a sermon on this, but it's there. Jesus says it. 
says they'll say, Lord, Lord. Like they're going to declare Jesus Lord. They're going to say it twice for emphasis. And they're going to declare all these things. We did miracles. We prophesied. We did these things in your name. And what does he say to them? He says, I never knew you. The test is not just what we do. The test is not just some knowledge we have about Jesus. It is that I know him. And more importantly, that he knows me. That is the foundation here. I don't want to get to the end of life and be told, I never knew you. Other places Jesus says, well done, and good and faithful servant. These are the two kinds of responses that God gives to us in the end. Jesus says some harsh things to crowds. I, I didn't put this up here because I didn't know what kind of time we'd have, but I want to read a little bit of John 2 where Jesus, he's done some miracles, he's done some teaching. The crowds are just amazed. And when he says to them, John 2, he says, and when he was in Jerusalem in the Passover feast, many believed in his name. They saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. He knows our wicked hearts. He knew the crowd was there because he turned water into wine, because he had fed people, and because he had said amazing things. He had healed people. They were there for the spectacle. He was, they weren't ready for who he really was. Other times he teaches, he scares the crowds away with things he says. It's harsh. Because you're in a church, it doesn't make you a Christian. Because you wrote a date down in your Bible when you were a kid, it doesn't make you a Christian. Because your parents took you to church, because you're here today, because you've given, because you've went on a mission trip, none of those things make you a Christian. Only Jesus himself does that. So the question isn't, what are the good things I've done? The question is, do you know Jesus? Do you know who he is? What would his response be to you? This is, what, this is what he points to. This is what he talks about. It's harsh, but it's clear, right? There's two paths. There's two paths because there's also, there's two foundations. It gets to the end. It talks about two kinds of houses, Right? What I'm amazed by in this story is the two houses are very, very similar, right? They're built by people. They're expected to be lived in. There's a storm that comes for both of them. And the whole parable, they're identical except for one thing. One's built on sand. One's built on a rock. It's the only difference. It's a big difference, but it's the only difference. So what is your house built on? Is it Jesus himself, or is it, I'm a good person, my grandma took me to church, I give sometimes, I don't cut people off in traffic, I haven't killed anybody, whatever it is, I voted for the right person, I give money to the right causes, I told this person about my good deeds, it's not enough, it's not enough to get you to holy God, Jesus is the only one that can. And in case you think this is harsh, I'm going to say Jesus said it, but I want to say there's a few other places in the New Testament where they give similar kinds of questions. Paul in 2 Corinthians says, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. He doesn't just say, check your Bible, read the date you wrote, remember your grandma took you to church. He says, examine yourselves, test yourselves, or do you realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? He says to, t to examine yourself. That's part of why we do communion. Every month, there's a reminder, a confession, repentance, reminder, Jesus is my way, not myself, not my law, not my goodness. It's Jesus. When Peter says it this way, therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the, res at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to be revealed. Put your minds on that. Be ready for action. Be ready to, to, to respond. I said clearly that it's not just what you do that makes you a believer. But he is saying, if you've listened to me, you're going to obey. You're going to respond. Jesus says it the same way. He wants not just hearers, but doers. It's not doers that earn their way. It's doers that respond to God. Doers that have been saved, that are on that path of life. Just like Christian, the story I told at the beginning. He was not saved because he stayed on the path, because he held on to the scroll, because he did these actions. He was saved 
because of the narrow gate, because of Jesus sharing the gospel with him, telling him which way to go, he responded in obedience. That's what he did. So as we come to the end, the question you have to ask, what is your life built upon? It's the only question. There are lots of ways to talk about it, right? There's fruit, there's houses, there's paths, there's a bunch of analogies. What is your house built on? If you were to die tonight, what's your response to God? Is it a list of things you've done for him? Is it things you've declared about him, miracles you've seen? Or is it, I know Jesus. Jesus knows me. Let me pray. Dear God, I thank you that you, you make it very clear. You've described what your kingdom should look like. You've described the way you want people to live in your kingdom. And then you've given us two options. You set before us life and death just like Moses did. You've come along and made it even more clear to examine my own life, to see that I'm in the faith, to contend for the faith, to see is there fruit? Does this fruit look like love, joy, and peace? Or does it look like the ugliness of the world? I just pray that we would, we would examine ourselves and that we would then rest in you. That we would not try to earn this and hear, oh, this is difficult, I better try harder. Instead, I would look to you and say, you're my only way. Jesus is my only way to heaven. My only chance of seeing this narrow gate, this hard path that few are on. That I would be encouraged by the other people along the path. I just pray that we would see people around us to bond together, to connect with, to walk this path of life together. And that we would be evangelizing people on the other path. That we would be telling them, there's, there's, there's one way to life all the other roads lead to death. I thank you that you've, you've made this so clear. You've spent four different analogies at the end of a sermon just to say, do you get it? Did you get it? Do you understand? One more time, did you hear what I said? I just pray the people in the room would, would hear this message and hear you speaking to them. If you're not a believer, I pray that this would prick your heart. The Holy Spirit would make you question and ask, what does it look like to repent, to believe, to obey? And I pray for the people in the room that are believers. You'd be asked the exact same things. That the Holy Spirit would talk to you, convict you, and you would respond by repenting, by believing, by obeying. I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.